I'm running for mayor. And the, re and the reason why I'm running, three reasons real quick. For the last 32 years. And in the United States, those are dominated by television ads and big rallies with, you know, thousands of people. And, um, and but, but there's a tradition of, of local politics, people running for mayor, people running in smaller towns and cities um, that had never really been looked at um, in a documentary. And I heard about an election that was going to be happening in Newark, New Jersey, which is a city across the river from New York City. Um, and it's, um, it's the largest city in New Jersey, but it's a city that has a lot of, um, a lot of financial problems. Many of the people there are, don't have, you know, they're poor, the education system is not good, um, there's a lot of crime. And there had been a mayor that had been the mayor of the city for 16 years. Um, and, uh, and another, uh, a young 32-year-old, uh, first term city councilman decided to run against him and I thought that would be an interesting topic for a documentary. This election starts to be become um, uh, the opposite of, of uh, most people's idea of how a democratic election is supposed to work. Sharp James, uh, who has run the city basically for that long, um, is not used to having outside uh, media attention. Um, because Newark is so close to New York City, um, New York City attracts all of the media attention. So any local news focuses on New York City politics and not Newark politics. A lot of people talk about it as a city that, that lives in, the, in a media shadow cast by, by New York City. And so as a result, the mayor has been able to kind of run things. He, he began to think, because I started the film following Cory Booker, he, he began to feel like I was a Cory Booker supporter only and I was out there to make him look bad. Um, and, and uh, you know, but he, but he kind of felt the same way about lots of, lots of media folks. It got pretty scary for me, actually. You know, over the course of the film, there are a couple of other run-ins. At one point, my camera gets broken by a member of the mayor's security staff. And, and a lot of this was happening um, by Newark police. These were not just thugs that he had hired. These were, these were official police. You know, I was working in Newark by myself. I, I, I didn't have the, the, the power of working for a network or working for a newspaper. I was just a guy who was driving the car and shooting with a little camera and I had, I was, had the microphones and I had the, the papers for the releases. And, um, and I think to, uh, I think the truth is I probably wouldn't have been treated quite this way if I worked for the New York Times. I think that, that Sharp James didn't want outside scrutiny, but he was smart enough not to do something like that to a television station or to, to a, a, an established newspaper. It's funny, you know, the, the State Department has this program where they send documentaries around the world, and when they first asked if, if they would, could include this film, I was very surprised, because it's not what Americans want to necessarily show the world about about how democracy works. You know, I, and I've sort of puzzled over this. Like, why would why why am I here? You know, why would they why would they sponsor uh, the screening of something like this? And I think the answer is because uh, because democracy requires um, requires people to pay attention to it, 
and it's not something that you just sort of flip a switch and then it runs. It, it requires you to stay on it and requires people in the press to stay on it. It requires voters to stay on it. Sharp James says he's the real deal. The truth is, Sharp James is getting really rich at the taxpayer's expense. While schools crumble and crime and drugs plague our streets, James has given himself a raise to over $200,000 a year. He bought two vacation homes, a 46-foot yacht, and a Rolls Royce. The real deal? How about a great deal for Sharp James? After 16 years, it's time for a change. And I think a lot of people knew that, um, that there was corruption that was happening in the city, but they almost felt like it was okay because he was our guy. And he had grown up in Newark, he was from Newark, and, and good for you that, you that you have a yacht and a, and a house, you know, and two houses and, and, and make $200,000 a year. Good, that's what you should, you should get that. Go for it, Sharp James. I show up at the debate with my camera, but the police tell me I can't film. I put the camera in my bag, but continue recording audio. As I take out my camera, a policeman from the mayor's security team comes out. It was a real challenge to my uh, documentary ethics um, to, to leave that scene the way that it is because my wife would heckle me all the time for, for saying, let go of my camera, let go of my camera. And um, so I really was tempted to re-edit my voice into the scene, you know, saying something like, you know, step away from my camera or something like that. But, um, but I, I decided to, to keep it as it actually was. Uh, so Corey loses that election um, and, and the movie ends with him preparing to run again. Uh, so now Corey is in his second term as the mayor, um, and uh, and um, you know Newark still has a lot of problems. But there have been a number of things that have been significantly changed. The the the, the crime rate has gone down significantly. Um, they've gotten a ton of new money for education, and, and Newark was not a city that had a ton of media. Um, and and there's a newspaper that covered the election, um, and a little bit some of the New York City press would come over to cover it. But, you know, partly that was the problem, was that it hadn't, ha that there was not a tradition of scrutiny. Um, but, uh, but I did have m people in the press tell me, um, you know, when, uh, particularly on that, that, at, that de at that debate, when, when the police break my camera, I had a reporter come up to me afterwards and say, you gotta be careful. You, you don't know what you're doing here, but this is, this is serious. I don't think that they, I, I, it was hard to, it's hard to quantify what the intimidation was. I, you know, people weren't getting, these guys that work for newspapers are not getting phone calls in the middle of the night saying, you better write this kind of story. It wasn't that. But, uh, you know, I don't, think the, I don't think the New York Times suffers from that. I don't think the Wall Street Journal, I mean, a, a, a significant news outlet doesn't feel fear that way. But they had their own problem. And, and, and what I felt like their problem was, was that they fell into um, a kind of reporting in the United States that, um, uh, that people sometimes call he said, she said journalism. And they will, in their desire to be uh, objective and neutral, which is good, I think that the media should be fair, um, sometimes they are not accurate. Um, and specifically what I mean is they sometimes will present things as equivalents that just aren't equivalent. After a debate between the Republicans and the Democrats, the people will come on television and they'll say, well, here are the three things that the Republicans said that either were untrue or stretched the truth, and here are the three things that the Democrats said. And I always think, isn't that interesting that they both said exactly three things? Um, and the truth is, they didn't say three things. But, but the media w is too afraid to say, the Republican told five lies and the Democrat told one lie, because then everybody will say, oh, you're, you're liberal media supporting the Democrats. And so the problem is that they allow themselves to just become amplifiers for two campaigns. One campaign says the earth is flat, and the other says the earth is round, and the, and the media says, 
there's a debate over whether the earth is round or flat. And one said this and the other said this. And they don't say to the people, the earth is round. It's just round. And, uh, you know, I feel like the media should be a referee. And a good referee doesn't call the same number of fouls on both sides. A good referee calls fouls when there are fouls. In addition to this problem, we also now, which didn't exist so much even 10 years ago, have uh, media outlets that are very conservative and others that are very liberal. And they spin the media, they spin information according to their, um, to their agenda. Um, and so it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough spot to be because on one hand I'm, I'm, I'm upset with the mainstream media for not, um, not taking a side or not calling fouls when there are fouls. But on the other hand, I'm upset with media that has decided that uh, fairness, that is basically a propaganda machine. I mean, we, we now have television stations that are essentially propaganda machines for, for, for different sides. And uh, in addition to, to what we call the mainstream media, which is, which is trying to, to, to deliver more of a balance. But um, I don't know, it's something that uh, that's, that's doesn't have a, an easy solution except, uh, uh, except vigilance from citizens and, and, and holding their media to task in the same way that they hold their government to task.